this video is on DNA and RNA. I will cover their structure as well as DNA replication. First, we will start by looking at the monomers that make up the polymers DNA and RNA, known as nucleotides. Nucleotides have this basic structure. You've got a pentose sugar. It's known as a pentose sugar because it has five carbon atoms. Then you've got a nitrogenous base, nitrogenous because it's containing nitrogen, and then you've got a phosphate group up here. This bond here is known as a glycosidic bond, and this bond here is known as an ester bond. These three elements join together via a condensation reaction where a molecule of water is lost. Nucleotides will join together in condensation reactions to form polynucleotide chains. This bond here is known as a phosphodiester bond. That's because it contains two ester bonds, as shown here, and a phosphate group. This bit here is known as the sugar phosphate backbone and it helps to provide protection and stability to DNA and RNA molecules. Up here we have the 5' prime end and down here we've got the 3' prime end. Now let's look in more detail at DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribo nucleic acid. This is because the pentose sugar in DNA is known as deoxyribose sugar. The function of DNA is to carry genetic information. That is all the instructions an organism needs to grow and develop. There are four nitrogenous bases that can be present in a DNA nucleotide. You've got adenine, represented by A, thymine, represented by T, cytosine, C, and guanine, G. The structure of DNA was discovered by James Watson, Francis Crick, and Rosalind Franklin in 1953. DNA has a double helix structure. With the two polynucleotide chains held together by hydrogen bonds between specific complementary base pairs. The base pairs are A will always pair with T and C will always pair with G. Between A and T there are always two hydrogen bonds whereas between C and G there are three hydrogen bonds. This means that if you have a higher percentage of CG base pairs compared to AT base pairs in a double helix of DNA, then the structure will be more stable because you will have more hydrogen bonds overall. It's also important to note that the two polynucleotide chains in this double helix are anti-parallel. This basically means that they run in opposite directions. The coil structure of DNA is really, really important because it protects the weak hydrogen bonds, preventing the code from being corrupted. Now let's take a look at RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. This is because the pentose sugar in RNA is ribose sugar. The function of RNA is basically to copy genetic information from DNA and carry it to the ribosomes to synthesise proteins. The bases in RNA are very similar to that of DNA, however there is one difference. So you still have adenine, cytosine and guanine, however instead of thymine in RNA you have U, uracil. Another difference between RNA and DNA is that RNA is actually single-stranded compared to DNA which is double-stranded and forms this double helix structure. The strands of RNA are also much shorter than the strands of DNA. There are three different types of RNA. Firstly, you have messenger RNA, mRNA. 
This basically brings information from DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, therefore directing the synthesis of proteins. Secondly, you've got transfer RNA, tRNA. This basically transports amino acids to the ribosomes and positions the amino acids in the correct place on the chain. Lastly, you've got ribosomal RNA, rRNA, which is basically the site of protein synthesis. Essentially, rRNA makes up the ribosomes. You may want to recognise the shapes of these. Lastly, let's talk about DNA replication. Firstly, I will just go through step by step how DNA replicates. So, step one. Firstly, DNA helicase is will break the hydrogen bonds between complementary base pairs on the two polynucleotide strands. Therefore, the helix unwinds. Step two. The original strands will act as templates. Complementary base pairing means that free floating nucleotides are attracted to the nucleotides on the template strand. So an A would be attracted to this T, a G would be attracted to this C, etc, etc. Step three. So DNA polymerase which is an enzyme, will catalyse the condensation reactions that join the nucleotides together in the new strand and also hydrogen bonds will form between the complementary base pairs. It's important to note that DNA polymerase will only work in one direction. It will only work from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end of the newly forming strand. This is because the active site of DNA polymerase is complementary to the 3 prime end of the newly forming strand. And since DNA has this anti-parallel structure, that means DNA polymerase will work in different directions on the two newly forming strands. Now, DNA replication is known as semi-conservative replication. This is basically because the two polynucleotide strands in DNA separate or they are unzipped for DNA replication to take place. Conservative replication would just be where the whole DNA helix is copied in one. Two scientists known as Messelson and Stahl proved this semi-conservative replication theory by experiment. So basically what they did is they grew two samples of bacteria. They grew some bacteria in a broth containing only light nitrogen known as N14. And then they grew some bacteria in a broth containing only heavy nitrogen known as N15. The 14 and 15 just stand for their isotopic masses. As the bacteria reproduced, it would take up nitrogen from the broth to make nucleotides for new DNA because you need nitrogen to make these nitrogenous bases. So then after a while, um, a sample was taken from each of these separately and spun in a centrifuge. DNA from the heavy nitrogen bacteria settled lower down in the centrifuge tube than the DNA from the light nitrogen bacteria, which settled a lot higher up. Then heavy nitrogen bacteria were put in a broth containing only ni light nitrogen and left for one round of replication. Then this sample was taken and spun in a centrifuge. If replication was conservative, you would just get one light band and one heavy band. However, this is not what happened. What happened is that there were, you got a band in the middle. This is because all the new DNA that was taken would have one light strand 
and one heavy strand present due to semi-conservative replication. Therefore, it had a medium weight. So now pause the video and have a go at these questions. Question one, draw the structure of a nucleotide. So you've got the pentose sugar here, then you've got a nitrogenous base and a phosphate group. Remember, this is a glycosidic bond and this is an ester bond. Question two, what is the name of the bonds that hold the sugar phosphate backbone in place? Those are phosphodiester bonds and they form in condensation reactions. Question three, what are the complementary base pairs in DNA? So A will always pair to T and C will always pair with G. Question four, what does DNA stand for? It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Question five, what is the function of RNA? Its main function is protein synthesis. Question six, which base does RNA contain instead of thymine? It contains uracil represented by you. Seven, is DNA replication conservative or semi-conservative? It is semi-conservative. And lastly, what are the two enzymes involved in DNA replication called? So you've got DNA helicase, which breaks the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs, unzipping the double helix. And then you have DNA polymerase, which joins the nucleotides in the newly forming strands. Thank you for watching.